Welcome to World Med School. My name is Neil Schluger and I'm Professor of Medicine, Epidemiology, and Environmental Health Sciences at Columbia University in New York City. This lecture will cover principles of therapy of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Multidrug resistant tuberculosis is defined as tuberculosis which is caused by isolates that are resistant to at least isoniazid and rifampin. Approaches to the treatment of multidrug resistant and extensively drug resistant tuberculosis include tailored drug regimens, the use of directly observed therapy, and in select cases, resectional surgery. The principles of designing a treatment regimen for multidrug resistant tuberculosis are shown on this slide. A regimen for MDRTB must be based on a meticulous history of drugs that have previously been taken by the patient, a knowledge of the epidemiology of drug resistance in the community, and whenever available, the results of drug susceptibility testing. The regimen ideally should include at least four new drugs to which the isolate is susceptible or should be susceptible. Always remember that one should never add a single drug to a failing regimen. I consider directly observed therapy essential in the treatment of drug-resistant tuberculosis. Surgery can be considered any time there's resistance to isoniazid, rifampin, and streptomycin, although the availability of surgery obviously varies quite widely around the world. Treatment should be continued for 18 to 24 months after sputum cultures have become negative, and whenever possible, consult an expert in the treatment of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Drugs for the treatment of MDRTB include those shown on this slide the so called second line parenteral agents, injectable agents, canamycin, amicacin, and capriomycin, the quinolones, including levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, which are the most active, oral second-line agents such as ethionamide, protheonamide, cyclosyrene, terizidone, and paraaminosalicylic acid, or PAS, and then so-called group 5 drugs, which have varying activity and often severe side effects. I will comment in a little more detail about the use of linazolid later on in the lecture. World Health Organization recently revised its guideline for the management of MDRTB and stressed these general principles. Rapid drug susceptibility testing for isoniazid and rifampin resistance, or at least at a minimum rifampin alone, is recommended over conventional testing or no testing at the time of the diagnosis of TB, obviously subject to available resources. The use of sputum smear microscopy and culture rather than microscopy alone is certainly recommended for the monitoring of patients with MDRTB during therapy. In the creation of drug regimens, the revised WHO guidelines include these important principles. In the treatment of MDRTB, a fluoroquinolone should be used, and a later generation fluoroquinolone, such as levofloxacin or moxifloxacin, are certainly preferable to early generation fluoroquinolones such as ciprofloxacin or ofloxacin. Ethionamide should generally be used in the treatment of MDRTB. And in general, four second line agents which are likely to be effective, including a parenteral agent, should be used in the intensive phase. Pyrazinamide should generally also be included in the intensive phase of treatment, that is, the phase. Um, that's used until sputum culture conversion. So that regimen should include at least pyrazinamide, a fluoroquinolone, a parenteral agent, ethionamide, and either cyclosyrine or paraaminosalicylic acid if cyclosyrine cannot be used. Group 5 drugs may be used but are not included among the drugs making up standard regimens for MDRTB. In the treatment of patients with MDRTB, an intensive phase of at least eight months duration is recommended. A total treatment of duration of at least 20 months is recommended in patients without any previous treatment for MDRTB. Outcomes of medical therapy for multidrug-resistant tuberculosis can be 
reasonably good and can approach 85% treatment success in selected cases with close monitoring and aggressive treatment, as is shown on this slide, which summarizes a variety of series of treatment for MDRTB. In other series, however, treatment outcomes have not been as good and mortality rates have been appreciable. I would like to comment specifically on a few newer drugs that are used in the treatment of MDRTB, including linazolid. Linazolid belongs to the oxazolidinone class of antibiotics. It's generally used for the treatment of gram-positive infections, although it has good in vitro activity against mycobacterium tuberculosis with fairly low MICs. On the other hand, linazolid is extremely expensive and, in general, will be uh, beyond the ability of many TB programs in terms of its cost. On the other hand, because of its activity, it has been used in cases of extensively drug-resistant TB, uh, and I would like to review that experience. The usual dose for the treatment of gram-positive infections is 600 milligrams twice a day, but for TB, because of side effects and the duration of therapy, the dose is often lowered to 600 milligrams once a day or even 300 milligrams once a day. Cures have been reported in a number of patients in which linazolid has been added to a regimen for multidrug resistant tuberculosis, but the use of linazolid certainly does not guarantee treatment success. Serious adverse events are common with linazolid. Neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, which may not be reversible, is common, as is bone marrow suppression and anemia, and many patients will have these side effects. The New York City Department of Health recently published data indicating that the addition of linazolid to regimens for multidrug resistant TB did seem to be associated with sputum conversion to negative and good outcomes, but recent data from Cliff Barry and others uh, looking at the use of linazolid in MDRTB while confirming its beneficial effect in many patients also confirmed the high frequency of serious side effects. In patients who received just 300 milligrams once a day of linazolid over a long period of time, at least 60 percent had serious side effects and in patients receiving 600 milligrams, at least 80 percent had serious side effects. The past several years have seen the development of several newer drugs for the treatment of tuberculosis. Most of these are still investigational, but I would like to comment on one which has recently been approved by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States for the treatment of multidrug-resistant tuberculosis. That drug, originally called TMC207, now called bedaquiline, has been made available for the treatment of MDR-TB. Bedaquiline is a novel, represents a novel class of drugs known as ATP synthase inhibitors for the treatment of MDR-TB. And in this slide from a study by Andreas Diakon, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009, you can see that patients with MDR-TB who were treated with multiple drugs but then in addition had TMC207 or bedaquiline added to that regimen, that those patients had a higher proportion of conversion from culture positive to culture negative than did patients with MDRTB treated with multiple drugs but not bedaquiline. And that's shown on this slide. Further studies conducted by the uh, pharmaceutical company Janssen um, that is developing this drug confirm this. Patients with multidrug resistant tuberculosis who received a cocktail of drugs including bedaquiline had a higher rate of conversion from sputum culture positive to negative than did patients treated without bedaquiline. However, in these trials that were conducted by the company, it was noted that there were, was a greater number of patients who received bedaquiline during MDRTB treatment who died than patients who did not receive bedaquiline. The Food and Drug Administration in the United States approved the use of bedaquiline for the treatment of MDRTB 
but noted that there was a serious concern about the safety of this drug. At present, the drug should be used quite carefully and in consultation with experts in the treatment of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Surgery certainly has a role in select cases of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. This, this slide shows the results of several surgical series conducted around the world um, where surgery was adjunctive therapy to multidrug resistant to TB. And you can see that in several of these series, treatment success rates combining medicine and surgery were quite high. In considering selection of patients for surgery, what are the important factors? First, as I mentioned before, patients should have a low likelihood of being cured with medicine alone. So surgery in general should be reserved for multidrug resistant tuberculosis patients whose TB really can't be expected to be cured with drug regimens um, that are available. So patients who begin with resistance to isoniazid, rifampin, streptomycin, and additional agents might be considered for surgery. Beyond that, patients with localized disease, where the surgeon can really remove all of the apparent disease, um, are good candidates for surgery. Patients should have good nutritional and overall medical status. There should be availability of drugs for medical treatment post-surgery as surgery alone is not curative, and there should be an experienced and willing surgeon. These chest radiographs are an example of a patient who was treated with surgery. The radiograph on the left shows bilateral upper lobe cabotary disease. This patient had TB resistant to isoniazid, rifampin, and streptomycin, amikacin, and canamycin. In this patient, both upper lobes were resected simultaneously by a very talented and experienced surgeon. And you can see on the right, that the patient had an excellent outcome. Drug therapy was continued for 18 months after surgery, and ultimately the patient did well. Overall then, the treatment of drug-resistant tuberculosis is in many cases successful, although it's difficult. I think these are the important points to take home from this lecture. The treatment of MDRTB is very complicated and often multimodality. It's expensive. The second line drugs are difficult to get and expensive, and ensuring an adequate drug supply is critical for patients if they will have a successful outcome for multi drug resistant TB. MDRTB has high morbidity, uh, has high morbidity both from the tuberculosis itself and from the therapy used to treat it. The second-line drugs, as I mentioned, have considerable side effects. Mortality is appreciable. Patients will die from MDRTB, and that's why early and aggressive treatment is really critical. I consider directly observed therapy essential in the treatment of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Many patients will have only one real chance at cure. So a well-designed regimen given to a patient on a daily basis in a supervised setting is really the best approach and presents the best opportunity for a good outcome. Expert consultation should be sought in all cases. The guidance of an expert is important because the drugs used to treat MDRTB often will be unfamiliar to practitioners, will have many side effects, will be difficult to monitor, and for those reasons, expert consultation is really required. If all of those things can be put into place, good outcomes can be achieved in many cases and should be the expectation for most patients. That concludes this lecture on the principles of therapy of drug-resistant tuberculosis. Thank you very much.